how do we find equalizers? Well, the, that can come in many forms. So, for instance, uh, with my clients, I will look at their fitness levels. I will look at uh, their mentality, their emotional fitness. And we have a number and series of um, uh, exercises uh, for the training uh, side of personal protection. So we will look to uh, obviously use uh, physical fitness, um, put in uh, positive pressure, positive stress. Uh, equally, we'll work on uh, breathing, on uh, mindset through meditation and uh, focused awareness. And then we'll work on uh, emotional things. So um, if there's any type of weakness in the emotions, that's quickly identified. And we've got a number of exercises to strengthen and develop the emotional side, which on that point, uh, I've often found over the years, a lot of systems that I've been involved with, uh, they seem to lack uh, emotional training, emotional strengthening. And so that was something that I um, worked a lot on. I went to um, other other types of uh, um, methods, techniques. Um, and then also, obviously, we've got strategy, technique. So we'll actually work on um, close combat techniques. We work on awareness techniques. We also work on uh, visualization. Uh, this is a very important uh, aspect of personal protection. Um, because the pictures that you have in your mind uh, are a type of reflection of, uh, of your state and also you can um, uh, be like a magnet so you can attract uh, negative, positive influences, forces um, also we'll look at the practical things of like your environment how you walk down the road uh, the areas that you go to and then there's other factors like uh, your home or your residency. So those can be looked at. Uh, we look at the barriers to entry. Uh, we can look at um, alarm systems, personal protection dogs, uh, devices, gadgets. Um, all of these things are just uh, creating uh, time and space. Um, so obviously the, the barrier creates the space. Also it gives you more time to um, use the correct action and not just uh, you know be a be in a reactive state of panic and fear um, so yeah fear that's another important part of this so we uh, reduce the fear and um, we increase the positivity in the person uh, and that can um, be reflected in the posture the demeanor the eye contacts or the awareness um, also with a lot of crimes if you're lucky, you'll get an interview phase. Um, what that basically means is, is that you're confronted by uh, the potential attacker and they're interviewing you to see whether you're suitable for, um, for their purposes, uh, whether you're going to be an easy target or not. So um, that would be verbal um, and visual communication, uh, which is a very important aspect of personal protection. It's very difficult to try and describe it just uh, through words. Uh, it's something that has to be done uh, within the classroom environment or or using uh, video technology so we can work on postures and stances and uh, creating distance looking for barriers uh, also looking for improvised weapons uh, you'll be surprised uh, what you can find in fact here's a good one for you now so wherever you are it doesn't matter where you are you could be uh, listening to this at home walking down the street, walking through the park, sitting in your car, driving your car, um, listening to this, this podcast. And I want you to try and identify one improvised weapon that you can get to quickly. I remember we're talking like in less than six seconds. So just look around you, just pay attention, be aware of an improvised weapon that, that you could use to work as an equalizer. Uh, likewise, look for improvised weapons that could be used potentially against you so there's always uh it's a, it's a double-edged sword so the improvised weapon can be used to your advantage it can be also be used against you uh here's a classic one which which just springs to mind 
Uh, a lot of people, they tend to have ornaments, maybe uh, swords or uh, daggers or knives and things like that um, displayed on the wall or the mantelpiece. And um, these can actually be used by the intruder or by the attacker. Now, something that's very important to understand that criminals are smart in, in the criminal sense. They're smart. They don't want to get caught. Now, when they're traveling to and from the crime, they don't particularly want to get stopped by the police carrying a weapon or a device. So quite often they'll either hide them or what they would rather do is use your um, improvised weapons or your devices or your ornaments, your tools against you. And then they can leave them there and be on their way. If they get stopped on the way home, or wherever they're going, then they're not carrying any um, any devices, weapons, or tools. So a classic one would be um, somebody will break into the workshop or the shed or the garage, and then they get the tools to then break into the house. Uh, another common thing is uh, plant pots. So plant pots can be picked up from through the window. Uh, same with uh, loose bricks. So as an example, I will often say to uh, a client when I do a, a house consultation um, to take a look or we'll walk around the, the, the immediate garden and see what objects can be used to actually break into the house. And you'll be, you'll be very surprised what you'll find. Um, and you may even find the keys underneath the plant pot or the, uh, the welcome mat outside. Uh, this is a, a common thing. Also, uh, car keys and um, house keys are left uh, on top of tires or uh, under the car and stuff like that. These things need to be looked at. Uh, if you're serious about your personal protection and uh, family protection, then um, these things need to be investigated and looked at properly. It's, uh, it's very important. If, if you're going to look at personal protection, uh, I, I try my best to look at it holistically. Of course, you can't... You can't cover every single possibility otherwise you you you, you are reaching a, a state of um, paranoia and so for instance with um, uh, personal protection is not equal um, there's also the financial side of it as well so you know if you've got the money you can have a full um, close protection team with a bodyguard uh, protection driver, um, backup vehicles, uh, personal protection dogs. Uh, depending on what country you live in, you could carry firearms, so on and so forth. Now, this costs a lot of money. So, once again, it's not equal. So, depending on your budget, your financial situation, um, for some people, they can't afford anything. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that you still can't up your game with personal protection. Um, personal protection is for everybody, even for the homeless person. Uh, I've actually had quite a few interesting conversations with homeless people with regards to their personal protection. Um, I, I, I make a point of, um, not always, but I make a point of, of um, talking to some homeless people because they're faced with a, um, a threat, a daily, nightly threat. Uh, they live in a very vulnerable situation because they have no uh, barrier, you know, no protective uh, barrier. Uh, they're literally living in a sleeping bag or a duvet or even a cardboard box in the street, in public. They have absolutely no protection whatsoever. So I've found in the past, talking to some uh, uh, homeless people, um, it can be quite uh, enlightening, it can be quite interesting um, to find out what they do for their own protection and they're actually uh, pretty smart they'll know you know they'll know certain places to go um, and unfortunately they've learned through a trial and error and um, I was actually talking to um, a homeless gentleman he was actually uh, ex-army we had a very uh, interesting conversation um, and uh, he, he had no teeth because they had been kicked out uh, while he was sleeping uh, it's a very sad story, actually. He said he, he woke up in hospital um, after being knocked out. Um, he had no teeth. He had no money to get new teeth. Uh, so he, he is now, uh, he's got no teeth, uh, which is a real shame. He's, he's a real nice guy. 
and um, I always say that everybody's uh, literally one step away from that position of being homeless. All it takes is uh, a little bit of bad luck or um, uh, a couple of accidents um, and anybody could find themselves in, in, in a homeless situation. And remember, um, home insecurity is actually um, part of personal protection. So number one is food. Uh, we put number two as home um, in our, in our uh, matrix. So food insecurity, home insecurity. So being homeless, you've completely lost your, your barrier of protection. Uh, which makes you very vulnerable, and um, like I say, she'd never, you should never take this uh, thing for granted. You know, this house or apartment or, or wherever you live, never take it for granted because that really does act as a great form of of protection, and um, uh, especially during uh, economic collapses or um, um, financial difficulties. Anybody could find themselves homeless uh, very quickly if you don't pay your rent or your mortgage or so on and so forth. So these are other other things that have to be considered. So um, personal protection is such a vast subject. It's um, it's fascinating to um, you know to be involved with this. It it caught my attention from a very young age uh, through some of my own life experiences and um, experiences of uh, family members and friends and people around me. Um, I quickly learned and realized that it's a very important aspect of existence and it's something that does need to be um, thought about. Fortunately, um, in the UK, it's relatively a very safe country, so I think a lot of these things are taken for granted. It's not until you go to um, a hostile environment or certain countries or even certain areas where you realize uh, um, the luxuries that, that you may have been granted or, or, or not, uh, depending on what end of the spectrum you find yourself in. Um, so other, other things could be um, your parents. So your upbringing. Um, nobody has an equal upbringing. Uh, some are granted uh, greater wealth or uh, confidence or environment um, than others. Some have very little, some have a lot. Uh, a lot of people are in between. Uh, like I say, it all depends on uh, where you live uh, and <laughs> depend on what your philosophy is. Um, we don't necessarily choose uh, where we're born, uh, our parents, so on and so forth. Uh, there are some philosophies that... that do uh, say that you know we do choose our family, our environment, uh, location of birth, and our circumstances. Um, it's not the sort of thing I really want to discuss uh, at the moment um, because it's <laughs> it's a massive subject and it's an existential uh, subject which would <laughs> it would need uh, a lot of time to be spent on that. But it is something to consider. Um, depending on your uh, philosophical persuasion. <laughs>